In just a few decades, the UK has gone from a country where homosexuality was illegal to one where gay people can get married. Levels of social acceptance are higher than ever before. You could say that there has never been a better time to be gay in the UK. However, one issue hasn't gone away, HIV. Advances in medicine mean that an HIV diagnosis is no longer a death sentence, but there is still no cure. And worryingly, last November, Public Health England released figures showing that HIV infection among gay men has never been as high as in 2014. So what's gone wrong? We decided to investigate. Our first stop was Birmingham, where we met Tom Hayes, an HIV-positive gay man who runs Beyond Positive, an online magazine about living with HIV. Hi, nice to meet you. You too. Hi. I'm Tom, come on in. Thank you very much. Tom showed us the practical side of living with HIV. Yeah, I just take um, one of these pills each evening. Okay. Um, they're, they're quite large, but it's um, three drugs in one pill. Um, and it helps to slow the HIV virus replicating in my body. We asked him for his reaction to the Public Health England HIV figures and what's behind the increase in infections. Part of it is the figures are going up because more people are getting tested. They're figures of diagnosis, not infection. But part of it is because we're still not teaching people properly about sex education and about relationships and HIV at school. Also, why do you think uh, gay men are taking more risk in their sexual life right now? I think risk-taking has always been quite high um, for anyone that's having sex. It's been more visible in the gay community, but I think um, the advent of quicker, more instant access to um, sex and drugs through things like Grindr, through um, marketplaces like Silk Road, it means people feel that they're more able to talk about um, having sex, having drugs openly, because it's more accessible and more freely available on these apps and websites. We wanted to find out more about Tom's last point on drugs during sex. So we went to King's College London, where David Stewart, an expert on the subject, was hosting a workshop on what is known as chem sex. He told us that drugs such as GBL and crystal meth are on the increase, being used in particular by gay men at sex parties. Crystal methamphetamine, methadone and GHB, GBL, they're very powerful disinhibitors that make you not care about anything. You feel invulnerable to harm. You feel all-powerful. Nothing you're doing now matters tomorrow. Someone who has first-hand experience of what camp sex really means is Enrique Rodriguez Moscoso, who now volunteers as a mentor for young people coming to terms with an HIV diagnosis. And my manager described when, he, when someone asked, uh, what is chem sex session? And it's not this kind of glamorous um, kind of meeting that you go to a house and you go with a bottle of champagne and a, you know, a bunch of roses and say, hello, I'm here. You get naked and every single you know, person is standing. No, you know, chem sex is not like that. Um, you go there, it's messy. People doesn't know what to do. Sometimes it's horrible. And for Enrique, the consequences of camp sex turned out to be really horrible. Yeah, became really dysfunctional to the point that I lost uh, my flat, my job, my partner, my family. When I think in camp sex, there is suddenly two flashbacks. One is, is really attractive and appealing and the other one is horrible and traumatic. So I suppose that it's like when you are a Formula One you know, driver and you have a trauma and you have a shock, you know, like you miss the adrenaline of the ride. But at the same time, you think about the accident and I don't want to get burned again. While Enrique thinks chem sex is a real danger, others see it as just one of a number of factors driving HIV transmission. I think we need more data about uh, on chem sex and how widely it's being practiced within a community. I think that uh, in terms of risk factors for HIV acquisition during chem sex, you know, prolonged um, sexual activity with multiple partners and unprotected or condomless sex um, under the influence of different um, drugs is obviously a, a much bigger risk factor for um, transmission of HIV. Um, but I do still think it's potentially in a smaller group of men.
what we're seeing emerging is a pattern of increased infections. Um, and I think there's lots of different reasons for that. I mean, you know, we can't just say, oh, it's just this one thing. But you know, the uh, issues which I think do relate to that are things like uh, increasing, increasing use of chems for sex. Um, uh, we're seeing increased prevalence of HIV within our community. Um, and so obviously there's more people who have HIV who are able to pass the infection on. Um, I think there are also uh, issues um, which, which relate to uh, the way prevention is currently funded. Um, we've seen over the years prevention being prevention budgets being slashed year on year on year. I think that prevention is, feels like it's kind of fallen off the, the radar a little bit, um, particularly because treatment is now so successful. So there's been a kind of shift in attitude around um, people's sort of fear around HIV. And I think that actually that's kind of changed now and people realise that you can live uh, a normal lifespan and have very little impact from um, taking treatment. So I think that has kind of shifted the public persona around HIV. So is Ken Sachs the reason HIV infections are rising? Well, nobody knows that for sure. What we do know is that its effect can be devastating and more research should be conducted to understand it better. After all, prevention is much cheaper than the financial and human cost of a new HIV epidemic. Okay. People